I think a lot of us have thought about the legacy we will leave behind. How will people remember us? What change were we able to make? Did people learn anything from us? You don't think you're going to have to think about this stuff until you're well into adulthood, but there have been lots of people taken from this world before their time. The man we will be talking about today was the most normal of teenagers, but left behind a legacy that changed a country and grieving parents determined to fight for justice for their son. Let's uncover how racism killed Stephen Lawrence. Hello and welcome to the 24th episode of Uncovered True Crime Podcast and the third episode in our Racism Killed series. This week we will uncover cases where racism has killed people of colour and their cases either haven't been fully resolved or are still unsolved. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify and other podcast streaming apps, as well as on YouTube. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at uncover underscore pod and on Instagram at uncover true crime pod. Before we get into talking about the murder of Stephen Lawrence, I want to share Corey Lewis's story. He runs a childcare and mentoring company in Sprayberry Crossing, Georgia, called Inspired by Lewis. On the 7th of October 2018, he was taking care of two children who he had been working with for years, 10-year-old Nicholas and his 6-year-old sister Addison. They were in a Walmart when a white female started following them. Eventually, she approached them and asked if the kids were okay. Confused, Corey asked, why wouldn't they be okay? Because there was no reason to think that they were anything other than happy and safe. Except in her mind, she felt, quote, something was off, unquote. Purely because he was a black man with two white kids in his custody. She called 911 to report her concerns so police arrived to do a welfare check, but were embarrassed when it became clear what had happened. Absolutely nothing except a black man looking after two kids. The parents, David Parker and Dana Mango, were horrified and spoke to the media about the effect this had on their children. Quote, they said they were scared that they would say the wrong thing and cause him to get arrested. Unquote. After talking to the parents, the police let Corey and the kids go on their way. Would she have done this if she'd seen a white person in Walmart with two black children? No. She called 911 because in her mind there must be something wrong if two white kids are with a black man. It's absolutely disgusting. But without any further ado, let us uncover the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Before I start talking about Stephen Lawrence, I want to make it perfectly clear that I understand I'm not going to be able to cover every single aspect of this case. Since his murder, there's been so many inquiries, government reviews, reforms in the Metropolitan Police, and I believe that some laws might have even been changed as a result of his case. While I don't want to in the slightest way undermine any of that, I think it would be unrealistic for me to be able to cover all of these things in one podcast episode, but if you do want to find out more about all these different inquiries and investigations that took place, all the sources will be available on my website or you can just google the case for yourself. I will obviously touch on some of the inquiries and the legacy that Stephen left behind, but I just wanted to make you all aware that there's so much more to this case, and I know if I spoke and went into all of these things, I wouldn't be able to do it justice. I'm fully aware of that. I want the primary focus of this episode to be about Stephen Lawrence, his murder, and how his case highlights the institutional racism that takes place not only in the Metropolitan Police, but in the UK as a whole. But without any further ado, let's uncover the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Stephen was born on the 13th of September 1974 to Doreen and Neville Lawrence, both of whom had immigrated from Jamaica to England in the 1960s. He lived in Plumstead with his parents, brother Stuart and sister Georgina. They were a normal family and Doreen and Neville did their best to teach their kids about faith, the importance of education, self-improvement and bettering themselves. Doreen said this about her son, quote, I would like Stephen to be remembered as a young man who had a future. He was well loved, and if he'd been given the chance to survive, maybe he would have been the one to bridge the gap between black and white because he didn't distinguish between black and white. He saw people as people." Unquote. He met his best friend Dwayne Brooks in high school when they were both 11 and they were very close. 
They both attended the Blackheath Bluecoats Church of England School, where Stephen studied English, craft and design, technology and physics. Stephen wanted to be an architect from a young age and was getting ready to go to university and start a new chapter of his life. He would never get to go to university, as he was killed in 1993 at the age of 18 by five men who Stephen never met. They killed him purely because of the colour of his skin. On the 22nd of April 1993, Stephen and Dwayne had spent time with Stephen's uncle at his house. At 10.30, they were both on their way home and were standing at a bus stop on Wellhall Road. Stephen walked up Dixon Road to see if he could see the bus coming. Dwayne followed him and that's when he saw the men who went on to attack Stephen on the opposite side of the street. Dwayne shouted on Stephen to see if the bus was coming and that's when one of the men shouted the n-word at Stephen and Dwayne. They crossed the street and attacked Stephen, stabbing him twice in an attack that only lasted around 10 seconds. Dwayne shouted at Stephen to run and to follow him and he did manage to run 100 yards before collapsing onto the ground. There were three witnesses to this attack, all of whom were standing at the bus stop. One of the men was called Joseph Shepherd. He knew the Lawrence family and immediately noticed them of the assault when he got off the bus. The other two witnesses proceeded to get onto the bus, not realising the severity of the assault that they had just witnessed. When the witnesses were later located and identified, they were not able to identify the people who had assaulted Stephen as the attack happened so quickly. The gang who had attacked Stephen fled on foot and Dwayne tries to flag down passing cars hoping that someone would stop and help. A married couple stopped to see what was going on and when they saw Stephen dying on the road, the woman kneeled beside him and whispered to him, quote, you are loved, you are loved, unquote, and it's possible that this was the last thing he ever heard. When the police arrived at the scene, they were not supportive of Dwayne, who had just seen his best friend be stabbed in a racially motivated attack. They said he was, quote, very agitated, highly excitable and virtually incontrollable." Unquote. I'm not sure how they expected him to react given what he had just seen, but they were not sympathetic to him at all and did not treat him with any kind of compassion. They were more interested with questioning Dwayne than they were in helping Stephen, and none of the police officers even attempted to give him CPR or first aid while they were waiting for an ambulance, although it would later be found that no first aid could have saved Stephen's life. They never checked what injuries he had or documented anything that had happened at the scene or tried to search for the gang of white men Dwayne described as having attacked Stephen. When the paramedics arrived, they immediately took him to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead soon after arriving. When Doreen and Neville arrived at the hospital, never in their worst nightmare did they expect to have to say goodbye to their child. During an interview she did for the Guardian newspaper, Doreen said, quote, What do you mean he's dead? He can't be dead. I don't remember what I did then. I can't remember whether I cried or anything. I was sitting at the time when we were told and asked if we could see him. I didn't believe he was dead and I was saying, no, he's not dead. He isn't dead. He can't be." Unquote. Dwayne was in the room with Doreen and Neville when they were told the devastating news, but he didn't have any time to grieve before police insisted on questioning him again. Although he was treated more like a suspect than a victim, they asked the Lawrence family questions about Stephen's character, insinuating that he started the fight, but his father refuted this, saying, quote, he wasn't into fighting one bit, unquote. Police didn't accept Dwayne's account of the incident or that he had been killed by a gang of racist thugs. They racially profiled him despite the fact that several racially motivated crimes, including two murders, had happened in that area around the same time. During the autopsy, the medical examiner confirmed that he had been stabbed twice and that both stab wounds were five inches deep. The blade hit five major arteries, which caused him to bleed to death. The medical examiner said, quote, It's surprising he managed to get 130 yards with all the injuries he had, but also the fact that the deep penetrating wound on the right side caused the upper lobe to partially collapse his lung. There is therefore a testimony of Stephen's physical fitness that he was able to run the distance he did before collapsing." Unquote. Police received their first tip the day after the murder took place. In a telephone box, someone had left a letter claiming to know the identity of the people involved in Stephen's murder and a similar note was found near a police car shortly thereafter. The writer of the note has never been identified, but they claim Neil and Jamie Accourt, Gary Dobson and David Norris had killed Stephen. When police made additional inquiries into the case, their names kept coming up, as did another name, Luke Knight. 
All five suspects were either 16 or 17 in 1993 and they were known to be violent, racist knife carriers. David and Jamie are court for brothers and their father Cliff was on the run at the time of the murder for drug offences, although he did keep in touch with his family. In March 1993, Stacey Bennyfield was stabbed in the chest after three men got into a fight with his friend and Stacey asked the men what their issue was. A man who Stacey later said was David Norris stabbed him while Neil watched. He survived when neither him or his friend were willing to press charges or make any statements likely out of fear of David's father Cliff. Three days after the death of Stephen Lawrence, he gave a statement to police and said that David Norris was the man who attacked him. David was acquitted of this crime, although this was likely due to the fact that his father bribed one of the jury members after attempting to bribe Stacey. With so many tips pointing to these men as being the people who killed Stephen, police would have had cause to arrest them, but they didn't. The detective superintendent working the case, Brian Whedon, would later claim he didn't know he could arrest them based off of evidence from the tips they had received. They decided to carry out surveillance on them instead, a decision which wasted precious time and hampered the arrest of the investigation. On the 4th of May, the Lawrence family held a press conference and stated that they were not happy with the investigation into their son's murder, which at this point was known to have been a hate crime. Two days later, Nelson Mandela met with the Lawrences to discuss the case and express his sympathies over the scientist's murder. This negative attention embarrassed the police so much that they spurred into action and by mid-June all five suspects had been arrested, their homes had been searched and Neil and Luke had been charged. Duane identified them in a lineup as being part of the gang who killed Stephen, although a month later all charges would be dropped as a judge deemed Duane's identification unreliable, as he had apparently told DES Christopher Crawley that he could not be sure if he'd identified the right people. Although Duane denies ever saying this, the CPS felt that they were unlikely to get a conviction. The Lawrence family were unsatisfied with this decision and decided that if CPS were not going to charge them, they would. They opted for a private prosecution, one that is like any other criminal prosecution, except the case is not brought by the CPS. They charged Luke Knight, Gary Dobson and Neela Court for the murder and the trial began in April 1996. The surveillance that the police had set up before the men were arrested was used against them and on the tapes they continued to use racial slurs on several occasions. They even described how they would kill a black man and how they hated black people. One thing they could not use against the men however was Duane's identification as the judge ruled it inadmissible again. This was a major blow to the prosecution and all three were found not guilty. Due to double jeopardy laws, they could not be retried for the murder. After the 1997 UK general election, the newly elected Prime Minister Tony Blair ordered an inquest into Stephen's case. The 350 page document is thorough and details several aspects of the case. If you are interested in reading it, or at least parts of it, it will be in my list of sources. The inquiry states, quote, the conclusions to be drawn from all the evidence in connection with the investigation of Stephen Lawrence's racist murder is clear. There is no doubt that there were fundamental errors. The investigation was marred with a combination of professional incompetence, institutional racism and a failure of leadership by senior officers. The flawed MPS review failed to expose these inadequacies. The second investigation could not salvage the faults of the first investigation." Unquote. They criticised the officers at the scene for their quote, lack of direction and organisation during the vital first hours after the death. Unquote. The family liaison officer for not updating the Lawrence family on their investigation and their quote insensitivity and lack of sympathy unquote for Doreen and Neville Lawrence. The senior investigative team for not pursuing leads correctly or promptly. They condemned the quote ill-planned, badly carried out and inadequately documented unquote surveillance of the suspects and they blamed institutional racism for a lot of the shortcomings in the case. They recommended 70 recommendations to be implemented immediately in the hopes that the injustice seen in Stephen's case would never happen again. The media was as outraged by the investigation as the inquest was and the day after the inquest verdict was read, the Daily Mail newspaper named all five suspects who had killed Stephen Lawrence, whose identities had not been released previously. They stated in the headline that all five were welcome to sue the newspapers if they were wrong. There was a major change to the double jeopardy law in England in 2005 which meant that people could be retried for the same crime if new evidence became available. It gave hope to everyone that one day justice would be served in Stephen's case. 
although it wouldn't be until 2011 that charges would be filed again against Gary Dobson and David Norris for the murder. Forensic technology had advanced a lot in the 18 years since Stephen's death and the prosecution presented evidence that showed Stephen's DNA on the men's clothing and within the men's house, which showed they had been in close proximity to Stephen at the time that he died. In January 2012, they were found guilty of Stephen's murder. Gary was sentenced to 15 years and two months in prison while David was given a minimum of 14 years and 2 months. Nowhere near as long as it should have been in my opinion as it had been 19 years since Stephen had died, although when sentencing the men, the judge said that the reason for her light sentence was due to the fact that they were juveniles at the time of the murder. Doreen Lawrence had this to say about the verdict. Quote, it's been a long time in coming, but we still have a long way to go. And so at this moment in time, all I can think about is Stephen. Perhaps somewhere down the line we will finally get justice for him because everything has just been a long time for us to get to this position. Unquote. In 2016, the police released a piece of evidence that had not previously been made public. Near the crime scene, they had found a handbag strap that had the DNA of a woman on it. They believed this piece of evidence might be vital on them finding a new witness and they urged anyone who had seen anything that night to come forward. To my knowledge, police have never matched the DNA to anybody and in 2018, police announced that there was little chance the investigation would ever progress as they had run out of lines of inquiry and were even considering closing the case, despite the fact that there are three men out there who never served time for their role in the murder. In 2000, the Metropolitan Police were made to pay the Lawrence family £320,000 in damages for their failings, but I doubt this did anything to alleviate their pain and devastation over losing their son to racist violence. Doreen and Neva Lawrence have conducted themselves with such grace and restraint in spite of all the obstacles they have faced and I have nothing but respect and admiration for them for how much they have fought for justice for Stephen. Doreen has spoken openly about the effect Stephen's death had on her and her family. Quote, it's like a numbness that's there and there's nothing you can do to make it easier. When I think about Stephen, what more can I do to bring justice for him? I've gone as far as I can go. I don't really know what else to do. Apart from going and arresting those people myself, what can I do? It's as if they're laughing all over again. I think about Stephen all the time. When you're watching TV and you see a child at a certain age, you think about what Stephen was doing at that age. Unquote. One thing that has kept her strong through her grief and the fight for justice has been her other two children. Quote, they provided me with a will to live, a will to continue, and a will to know that I have to keep strong for them. Unquote. Stephen's parents felt that given the injustice Stephen had faced in England, it wasn't right to bury him there, so he was laid to rest in their home country of Jamaica. Stephen's case is widely known in the UK due to all the work and campaigning his parents have done to fight for justice for him. Several inquiries and investigations were launched to try to fix the broken system that let Stephen and his family down and let three of his killers get away with murder. Neville and Doreen launched the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust, which seeks to help help people from disadvantaged backgrounds succeed in their chosen career. The 22nd of April was declared in the UK as National Stephen Lawrence Day, so no one will ever forget his case, the injustice he faced due to the colour of his skin and the legacy he has left behind. Stephen didn't know his attackers, he had never met them before the night they took his life in an act of racism. Three of his killers had never faced legal repercussions for their role in his death, although they have been arrested numerous times for other hate crimes and drug dealing offences. They all continued to deny their role in the murder despite the evidence against them, although they are still seen as guilty in the court of public opinion. I really hope that one day Neil a court, Jamie a court and Luke Knight will face justice for the murder of Stephen Lawrence, however they probably never will. Although Stephen's case has done a lot to change policing, education and how young black men are treated today, it would be naive to think that racism still does not exist in this country. And as someone who lives in the UK, I can tell you that racism is absolutely still in full force and it's disgusting. Remember, there will be no justice, there will be no peace and no lives matter until black lives matter. All photos and sources related to this case can be found on our website at www.uncoveredtruecrimepodcast.co.uk.
www.thegreatdetective.co.uk. That's everything I have for you today. Please tune in tomorrow for the next episode in our Racism Killed series. Thank you for listening till the very end. Please stay safe and have a good night.